This uh, message series, 2017 Resolutions, this is part five, and the way this is supposed to go is there's one more. I started out thinking I want to do one sermon that deals with looking at what I've been calling soul goals instead of resolutions that may not have as much long-term meaning or even personal meaning for us, but looking at not what we can do for God as much as what can God do in us, what can God do for us. And um, how many of you know if your bus is broken down and Clark Kent is on the bus, it doesn't make a lot of sense to get out and try to push it up the hill yourself. Okay, so God, God it, it, you know, it's very similar. Sometimes with God, we, we think, well, we glorify him by doing a bunch of stuff for him. But sometimes we glorify God by asking him to do what he does. Um, we glorify Clark Kent by asking him to superman the bus, you know. We glorify God by asking him to do what no one else can do in us, and that's change us. Change us from the heart to, to the outside. And that's what... I've been attempting to remind us of over and over again these last weeks. And it was interesting because uh, Peter did the, did the same thing. He, re, he reminded the people he was, uh, that he cared about um, in the church of these very basic transformational um, character issues that we need to attend to in our lives so that we are actually um, experiencing God and experiencing the kingdom of God and, and advancing his kingdom to others around us. Someone was talking yesterday at a conference we, several of us were at um, regarding uh, disciples who make disciples. And, and uh, one of the things they were talking about is the difficulty of herding a bunch of cattle on a large ranch. One way you can do it is you can build a fence around all these cattle, which would be very expensive and costly and, and maybe even just impossible in terms of the resources that it would take to keep all the cattle together. Someone offered, Janine was brilliant, she said, well, just brand them, you know. <laughs> and, and some at the table thought that was a little cruel, but I, I thought, I've been to Roundups. That's what they do. They brand the cows, and uh, you know, in case they get stray, they'll find them. But one guy said, "No, another way to do it, which is really the best way, is just to dig a well in the middle of their pasture land, and they will never wander very far from that well because they know they can always come back. That's that's their life source. That's their that's where they're going to." be fed and where they're going to be, um, you know, have their thirst quenched and that's how they're going to live. And so in a very real way, <clears throat> our lives sort of, if we can see the mission of our lives that way, is to dig wells for people so, so that others will know where they can come and drink and receive life. And that, that, so we have to be that kind of people. We have to be the kind of people that are so resourced by the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives and through his word abiding in us that there's something for people to drink and they'll know that. And, and part of the conference was about being the kind of people that are, are, are sort of advertising that we're wells. And that's not by telling people necessarily. It's by being a well, you know. It's by being a resource. It's... Um, being the kind of person that people can see are, are, are growing. They're humble. They, they get it. They're not perfect, but they're, they're, they're people that have joy. They're people that have peace. They're people that are working in their lives and not judgmental people. They're, um, et cetera. They're, they're folks, on the other hand, that the guy that was talking called it Jesus weird. You know, they're, they're, they're people that aren't afraid to say, hey, can I pray for you? And, and that our friends actually expect us to do that and really even want us to do that. As opposed to, you know, they're, they're, we're, the, we're the spiritual folks on the block, you know. We're the, 
we're the people they, they know. They're a little off, but, the, you know, if things get tough, I'm going to go talk to, uh, to James. I'm going to go talk to uh, Faith because she's a little Jesus weird, you know, whatever. <clears throat> I, know, I, I know I'm getting a little bit off here. So, but, so what I want to do today to give you an idea of, of where I'm going so your outline doesn't confuse you is, is I, I want to introduce again the life that Jesus has called us to. I, I want to just briefly draw your attention to the outline for the steps along the path of life that I want to refer to one more time. And then I want to review a little bit number six in terms of fighting uh, and learning the interplay between fighting sin and fighting Satan. I talked about that last week, how these things can overlap. It's not perfect science. Although the New Testament does give us three areas of battle, and there may, you know, the, the, the battling the world's culture, and, and that it throws at us to, to turn away from God and turn away from his paths and to follow the zeitgeist, you know, the, the prevailing and pervasive um, direction of a particular culture, and our culture, as we know, is, is drifting further and further away from biblical values, from, uh, from, from God's word in the Old and New Testaments. And, um, and there's a battle against that system. And we're not to be conformed to it, but we're to be what? Transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we may prove what the will of God is, that which is is perfect and um, a few other things, which I forget right now. But perfect's good, right? <laughs> um, it's good. It's good. God's will is good. Um, and then there's, of course, our flesh. Ouch. You know, that... that um, and it's, our flesh is a tough one in Scripture to figure out a little bit because sometimes uh, Paul will speak about the body being sort of the beachhead for sin happening and the flesh. Sometimes they're used interchangeably. Usually they're not. The New Testament basically has a favorable view of the body. God created it. So the body isn't seen as bad or sinful per se, it is seen as an instrument of sin as we yield to the flesh, which is what he refers to as that indwelling bent to not follow God's will, to do our own thing, our own way, you know, the sin nature, whatever. Different theologians will refer to it different ways for different reasons. I'm comfortable with... Uh, letting there be a little bit of tension and ambiguity uh, about the specifics of how that all works. If we get overly technical, I think, sometimes with Scripture, we miss a lot. We can get real real narrow and rigid and, and think that this means this and that means that, and we start creating um, theologies and doctrines that aren't really helpful to us because they're not based on reality. Um, Someone said, you know you're wrong when you bump into reality, uh, which I love. I love that idea. You know, there's, there, we do that all the time, don't we, as believers? Well, I'm absolutely convinced. Well, maybe not, you know. <laughs> Why? Because I bumped my head into something called reality. And, and it's not that I'm saying God's word isn't reality. What I'm saying is sometimes our read of Scripture can be very rigid. And, and I, I think a lot of it has to do with fear. I think a lot of it is we're just afraid um, to let God be God and, and to let tensions exist. And there's some areas that we're not just going to get all figured out. How many of you are comfortable with that? Yeah, good. I love it. There's two of us. All of the, anyone who's been beaten up by life is comfortable with that, you know. Uh, so so we're going we're gonna to look at the life that Jesus has outlined, that the scriptures are offering to us, and the path that I've kind of outlined, as you can see in Numbers 1 through 5 and 6, when I'm talking about spiritual warfare, I want to talk about being strong in the Lord and the strength of his might, which is in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. 
but the flip side of what I talked about last week, which is how to fight, and, and this is dealing with who we are. To be strong in the Lord doesn't mean that we've just been working our spiritual muscles, you know, and we can go toe-to-toe with the enemy because we're armed with the spiritual armor that Paul talks about and the sword of the Spirit, and we know the word, and we're just going to do some filleting and some slicing and some charging at the enemy. Uh, there are times for that, and there, but I, I want to talk about being strong in who you are in the Lord. Being strong in who we are in Christ. This is a, a matter of our identity. Who has he called us to become? And in my view, is really, really important. I'm learning this once again. And I think there are things that as believers we learn over and over. And, and, and it's just the way it is. Because we need to remember and focus and be reminded on the important things. So let's, let's just back up for a minute before we get to who, who we are, being strong in who we are in the Lord. Um, when we ask people frequently why Jesus came, you will hear a number of answers, but rarely the real one. I hear people frequently say he came to forgive us. He came to die for us, which is good and true. He came to teach us the way of love, which is good and true. He came to die so that we might go to heaven, which is good and true, etc. They're all true, but they're all partial answers. And Jesus himself told us why he came. He stepped onto the scene in a synagogue in Nazareth, and he reaches back to a 400-year-old prophecy to tell us why he's come. And he quotes from Isaiah 61.1, which goes like this. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. Now Jesus is saying God has sent me on a mission, and I have some great news for you. God has sent me to restore and release something, and that something is you. And Jesus could have chosen, and me, by the way, so us. He could have chosen any one of a thousand other passages to explain his life's purpose. He could have said, I am the sacrificial lamb. I am the root of Jesse. I am the morning star. But at the opening moment of his ministry, he chooses this passage above all others. And this is the heart of his mission. And in everything else he says and does finds its place under this banner. I am here, Jesus says, to, to give you back your heart and to set you free. I am here to restore you and heal you and free you into the glory of what I meant you to be when I created you. Oh, wow. That's it. You know, one of our friends, Sue, uh, last week mentioned that. She had, she shared after I spoke. In the last two weeks, I'd been talking a lot about sin and she made a really good point, and, and that is that that's not all there is to focus on. There's another side of this whole thing, and that is who we were created to be. John 10.10, 10, one of my favorite verses in Scripture, Jesus said, I have come, it's on your outline, that they may have life and have it to the full. That's why I came. And that's what Jesus offers us. That's an offer from God himself. And look what happened when people touched Jesus and Jesus touched people. What happened? Give me some shout outs. Miracles, healings, the blind would begin to see. The lame would begin to walk. The deaf would begin to hear. The dead were raised. In other words, I think he was illustrating over and over again 
the idea that to be touched by God is to be restored. And this is good news. This is great news for for a broken world. This is great news for me. This is great news for you. That he's, he's in the business of restoring us. So that we might become all that God meant us to be. And that's what Christianity is supposed to do for people. It's not supposed to make them little, you know, religious robots. It's supposed to restore them. It's supposed to give them life. It is supposed to be a transforming process. It's supposed to set us free. It's supposed to bring us fully alive. And many of us get get sidetracked because the enemy lies to us, because we get confused and muddled in our thinking, and we'll get pulled off, to the side, behind the bushes somewhere, and we get left and we just, we're alone and we're tired and we're sad and we're so focused on our own weakness that we simply forget. We forget. We're only half alive. And we're broken again. And we have to be reminded we don't have to stay there. But God has designed it so that we must, we must engage. You know, we, if we just sit there and don't tell ourselves the truth about ourselves and about God, we can very easily be defeated. Defeated. Even though the war has been won. So we're in this fight. I love what King David said. He said, you know, and I think Jesus was tapping this for sure in my mind in John 10. In Psalm 1611, let's read this one really loud together because there's nothing else to do, okay? Ready, go. You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. Now, I just wanted to toy around a little bit with my um, Bible study software. And so I looked up this word in the Hebrew for life, the path of life. And here's the way it's used very often. You know, basically it means living and alive. That, you, you could have got that on Wikipedia probably, but... Um, It's often used of that which is green, of vegetation, of flowing fresh water, of lively activity, specifically of men or women, reviving like the springtime, um, or wild beasts. And that was my favorite one. So to be alive is to be like a wild beast. You haven't been, you know, put down and trained and caged. You've been released. You're free. You're wild. You're ferocious. You're living in the environment that your creator designed you to live in. That idea. And then I thought of how several years ago I was at the zoo with my daughter Erin and she was really interested in the monkeys and I just thought the monkeys are gross. Let's Let the monkeys do what they do. I want to check out the lion. The huge male, nearly 500-pound African lion. And I looked at him, and I was in awe at his power, at his size. His paws were enormous. They were just huge. And when he yawned, his teeth would send shivers down your spine. And, you know, he's the king of beasts. But my heart broke for this big cat because this wonderful terrible creature should have been out roaming the savannah and ruling his pride and striking fear into the heart of every wild beast but instead he spent every hour of every day and every night of every year alone in a pin as small smaller than my bedroom He wouldn't roar. He wouldn't look at you. He wouldn't swipe at the gawkers. 
He would just lay there or stand there and sway from side to side with the weariness that comes from absolute boredom and torture. For after years of living in this cage, a lion no longer believes it's a lion. It doesn't change reality. It was Thoreau who wrote, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. Sometimes I feel that way. Like the lion, God created us to be free, to be fierce, to be bold and confident about life. He created us for freedom, and yet our quest for freedom from God has caged us, and we find ourselves resolved to a life of monotony, of struggling to survive. Because like the lion, we have forgotten who we really are. Most of the time we feel more fearful than fierce, more fenced in than free. That we're simply here to kill time. And it's killing us. I'm having in these days to remind myself who God created me to be. And I think he wants me to share with you that he wants to remind you of who he created you to be. Paul reminds us it was for freedom that Christ set us free in Galatians 5.1. And he's building on Jesus' own words, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And Jesus himself said, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. So Jesus is serious about this freedom stuff. So we should be, amen? We should be. I heard yesterday at the conference we attended, again, just to refer to that, some young lions, some kids from Youth with a Mission. They called themselves circuit riders. And they are going to college campuses and sharing Jesus. Talk about lions, either that or Daniel in the lion's den. I don't, right? But they're not afraid. They're going and they're, they're sharing the Lord. And Friday night, um, our, the guy doing the teaching yesterday got a text from these kids, from two kids at uh, a university in Florida. And they shared and said, Alex, we began sharing the Lord with two guys who were vaping in the courtyard of a part of the campus. And one of the guys broke down and uh, both of the guys that they were talking to about Christ became followers of Jesus. One of the guys went back and got his dorm mate. He had an encounter with Jesus also and was healed and became a believer. They went back to their dorm and invited some of their friends over. They were praying and one of the girls heard someone praying in tongues and asked, what language is that? And then she came to Christ. And by the end of the night, one night, 13 young people on that college campus had began their walk with Jesus. And just to put a cherry on top, they baptized five of them. One night. And then he played a video, and those same kids now were in a group in the dorm room praying for us. And then Alex took a video of all of us. There must have been a few hundred people in the room praying for them. These kids were living. They're they're not caged. And I'm not saying that to live your destiny or for me to live my destiny that we have to go to college campuses and share the Lord with young people. But there's something he's put in your heart. There's something that he's called you to. There's something that he's called me to that, that, that is 
full of, of life and destiny and purpose. And we got to be about our Father's business. And that's what our church should be about, is helping people discover that. And so I've been talking about these soul goals as, as paths on the, on the as, as stepping stones on the path of life. And to remind us, interestingly, unfortunately to some of us, that we are in a spiritual warfare, that we must fight. And <clears throat> recently I came across a list of combat rules. The first one is, if the enemy is in range, so are you. The second one is, don't look conspicuous, it only draws fire. Third one, the easy way is always mind. Try, this is the fourth one, try to look unimportant, they may be low on ammo. The fifth one, teamwork is essential, it gives the enemy someone else to shoot at. Sixth one, if your attack is going well, you've walked into an ambush. Seventh, I mean, this, this, this is sort of funny, but it sort of like has actual, you know, hints of reality to our own Christian lives, right? I love number seven, don't draw fire, it only irritates the people around you. Eight, the only thing more accurate than incoming enemy fire is incoming friendly fire. Oh, Lord. Let it not be. Nine is anything you can, wait, anything you do can get you shot, including doing nothing. That's a big one. Doing nothing isn't helpful. So that's a note to Jeff. Don't grovel. Self-pity stinks. It's not going to help anyone. Amen? Uh-oh. I didn't hear any amens there. Maybe I'm the only one that lives on that one sometimes. Um, number 10, <clears throat> the enemy invariably attacks you in one of two ways. When you are ready for them and when you are not ready for them. Okay? So might as well get ready. So be strong in the Lord. So be strong, be fierce, be strong in the Lord in who you are in him. Not only are things, see, th this is so critical. We tend to really believe, I tend to really believe things are as they seem so often. But things are not as they seem. And that is what Jesus was trying to tell us. And that is what Paul was trying to tell us. And that is what Peter was trying to tell us. And that is what God is trying to tell us even one more time today. Things are not as they seem. There is an invisible realm. You know, you are not what you think you are. There is a glory to your life that your enemy fears and he is hell-bent on destroying that glory before you act on it. That's, that's what the battle is often about. And the scriptures are full here. Genesis 1.27 from the very beginning. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. In his image. Psalm 8. 3 through 5, in the New Living Translation, I'm going to read it to you. When I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, speaking to God, the moon and the stars you have set in place, what are mortals that you should think of us, mere humans that you should care for us? Listen to this. For you made us only a little lower than God, and you crowned us with glory and honor. There is a flip side. Yes, we are sinful people living in a sinful world. But there is another side to this. You have been crowned with glory and honor, and that's after the fall. There is still a glory. There is still a residue of what it was that God created us to be in each one of us, and it's the, the thing that's happening when God 
is transforming us is he's making us a little bit more and a little bit more like that. And he will complete that work. It says that God who began a good work in you and me will perfect it. He will perfect that which concerns us. And that is an important message for us to hear in these days, in my view. There is a glory to our life. And it's been the object of a long and brutal war. Lurking in the garden was an enemy. Unable to overthrow the mighty one, he turned his sights on those who bore his image. He lied to us about where true life was to be found, and we believed him, and we often continue to believe him. We fell, and our glory faded, but God did not abandon us not by a long shot, because this is what Jesus came to restore. What a story. In fact, and I've said many times, and, and, you, and many have taught me this reality, and that is all these greater stories that our culture tells of, a, of, of good versus evil and the, and the underdog conquering and people being restored, all this great stuff, it's telling our story. They're all pictures, they're all images to, to remind us of this story that we're caught up in and who we are. Because our story didn't start with sin, and thank God it does not end with sin. It ends up with glory. Those he justified, he also what? glorified. Romans 8.30. And in the meantime, we're being transformed into that glory, from glory to glory. So one of the paradigm changes that we need to get in our minds is that we are a part of a war, a cosmic war. And, and as I said, the positive side of this paradigm shift is I have a valuable role to play as God's image bearer in the world. Look at um, Psalm 16.3 says, As for the saints who are in the land, they are the glorious ones in whom is all my delight. And you guys have heard it a million times that saints is just referring to people who have been touched by God, who are set apart by God, who are God's people, not Mother Teresa necessarily, though she is a saint. She may be a super saint, but you're a saint, I'm a saint, even the guy named Bernard is a saint. So um, that's a dumb joke that goes back a ways. <clears throat> and someone said, actually John Eldridge said, of all the eternal truths we don't believe, this is the one we doubt most of all. Wow. I believe that's probably true. That our days don't matter, they're not extraordinary that they're simply filled with mundane, um, you know, hassles, mostly, that we're a dime a dozen, that uh, we're nothing special, probably all disappointments to God. I know that, boy, if I'm not careful, that's where I live. Man. And, and, and we have to think about it. That God has put on us a glory that he created us for. That it's a glory so deep that all creation pales in comparison to that glory. Wow. A glory that is unique to you. Just as unique as the way you laugh. Some of you laugh really weird, but that's okay. <clears throat> I certainly do. <laughs> so throughout Scripture, um, God is trying to show us this, that we have a crucial role to play, that things are not as they seem, and that we are not 
what we seem. A little boy will slay a giant. A prisoner becomes the prime minister, the most powerful nation in the world. A loud-mouthed fisherman who can't hold down a job becomes the leader of the Christian movement. And once we begin to get a hold of this, it really begins to change us. The way we think about ourselves is important. I have a friend of mine that's trying to tell me that all the time. I got this also from John Eldridge that really changed a lot about the way I see movies. He said, you will not think clearly about your life until you think mythically, until you see with the eyes of your heart. Listen to this, a slipper for you. Some of you will know that that is probably talking about Cinderella. Have you no other daughters? No, said the man. There is a little stunted kitchen wench. Yikes, sorry for that, but it's in the book. Which my late wife left behind her, but she cannot be the bride. The king's son said he was to send her up to him. But the stepmother answered, oh no, she is much too dirty. She cannot show herself. But he absolutely insisted on it, and Cinderella had to be called. She first washed her hands and her face clean, and then went and bowed down before the king's son, who gave her the golden slipper. Then she seated herself on a stool, drew her foot out of the heavy wooden shoe, and put it into the slipper, which fit like a glove. And when she rose up and the king's son looked at her face, he recognized the beautiful maiden, who had danced with him and cried, this is the true bride. The stepmother and two sisters were horrified and became pale with rage. He, however, took Cinderella on his horse and rode away with her. And I love this part of the story because we see here the heroine's glory being unveiled. To have her finally rise up to her full height Mocked and hated, laughed at, spit upon. Cinderella is the one the slipper fits. She's the one the prince is in love with. She is the true bride. And he goes on to say, just as we are. The bride of Christ. The church. Come, I'll show you, John wrote in Revelation 21.9. The bride the wife of the lamb. See, the fairy tale here is is true. Not Cinderella. But the one that God's telling us about. The king's son insisted she come out of hiding. Though her family would keep her in the cellar, he'll have none of that. Come out. You are mine now. Let your light shine before men. If you're like me, you think about that and you go, wow, could it really be that God feels that way about us? Does he feel that way about me? This is the last thing the enemy wants you to believe. He doesn't want you to buy that, to own that, to walk in the humility of that. But let me read to you, 2 Corinthians 3, and starting in verse 7, it says, Now if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, fading though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold, We are not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. And we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Wow. One commentator 
said, we are in the process of being unveiled. We are created to reflect God's glory, born to bear his image. Wow. Now, I'm going to close, should have already, actually, with the, the movie The Lion King. Ignore the circle of life stuff. But the whole myth is borrowed from Christianity. There once was a beautiful kingdom, but it was stolen by the evil one. Its glory has been marred badly. Now it's time for the true king to come back and take over. But Simba, the lion heir to the throne, doesn't believe who he is. His father was murdered when he was young, and the enemy blamed it on Simba. Simba ran away, and after years of losing heart, he winds up living with a warthog and a meerkat, whose highest ambitions in life are breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Then one night, Simba's father appears to him in a vision. Mufasa says, Simba. Simba, father? Mufasa. Simba, you have forgotten me. Simba, no, how could I? Mufasa, you have forgotten who you are and so forgotten me. Simba, you are more than what you have become. Simba, how can I go back? I'm not who I used to be, Mufasa. Remember who you are. You are my son, the one true king. Remember who you are. Simba finally throws off the veil of shame and self-reproach and goes back to take the kingdom that is rightly his. As a result, his glory and the glory of the realm are restored. Remember, remember who you are. That can get pretty heady and maybe lead people into pride. But I don't think it will if we remember who we are in him. It's God that created us, it's God that redeemed us, and it's God that um, is restoring us. It's, it's being in Christ that gives us any glory at all. But that glory is real, and we have to remember. We live in a world that's filled with brokenness and evil and, and difficulty and, and pain, but <clears throat> that doesn't undo the reality that, you know, and, and especially it actually answers things. It gives answers to why there's so much struggle. But it also tells us that there's a way through it by, by connecting with God. And one of the things that I was going to talk about, and by connecting with each other, reminding each other, we need each other. That's why the, there's a church. If we didn't, it, it would just be like God did this, it's over, Jesus rose from the dead, let's, you know, go out there and just you and Jesus it. But he didn't, he called us together because we need each other. We're like a band of brothers, we're like, a, we're like a, a, an army, you know, that are, that, and we're fighting an enemy, but, and we're fighting for each other. I'm fighting for Melissa, and, and maybe she's fighting for me. I'm fighting for Lori and, and for Jesse, and hopefully they're fighting for me too. We're together in this. And that has to become more and more real to us in the days ahead. So we'll fight and we'll and we'll talk and we'll share and we'll encourage because this is a rough war is not pretty. I always go to sleep at night watching war documentaries. And for a while there, my wife thought I was just out of my mind, you know, I'm sure. (laughs) She said, Why are you watching those? And you know, I'm not sure I could have answered that question until this morning in a new way. I think I think it reminds me that, you know, this is, this is real. This is, we're in this battle. And there's something about watching these courageous soldiers, you know, not kill people. I, I'm not that, not that part of it. But just they're brave enough 
to risk it all for a cause greater than themselves. And that's a part of what we're all about in the church of Jesus. So let's come to the table and, and say, you know, Jesus is saying, remember me. And, he, and, and I do think that in those words, he's, he, he's eating with his disciples and he probably wouldn't hesitate to say, and remember who you are in me. Take it, take it a little further because Jesus did not die on the cross for ants. He died on the cross for you and for me. So I'm going to ask us to come and uh, to the to the table, if you would, um, and um, let me pray, Lord, as we come to the table to take communion. We pray that we would reflect on the reality of who you are, and that we would reflect on who we are in you. Not to be puffed up about ourselves, but to be reminded of your glory, of your grace, and the glory that you've deposited into each one of us. That in spite of that image of God being marred and being worn thin in our lives, there is still a, uh, a faint image And we pray that that image would be restored completely in each one of us. And if you would just reflect for a moment in your own heart what what areas may be actually creating friction and and further eroding the image, just like a coin that's... I heard Jack Hayford talk about that once, just a coin that had an image, but through circulation had been worn thin through so much handling. But the image hasn't been erased. It's just been worn thin. And uh, that God God can restore that. He can do that. And that's what, if we just keep that in our minds for a moment as we come to the table and say, Jesus, restore your image in me. Make it more and more glorious because this is his body and this is his blood his body broken for you his blood shed for you and for me Lord let these symbols like the myths that we just talked about um, not that these are, are mythic but Lord that they do symbolize something so deep and so powerful and some some believe even more that, that these elements are, are more than just symbols, but are, are actual ways that we partake of the body and blood of Jesus. And, and Lord, that's, that's probably closer to reality. So Lord, as we come, let us be humbled and receive these elements with thanksgiving and partake of the body and the blood of Jesus. Restore us, O oh Lord, we pray. Amen.